Welcome back. We will be covering chapter seven this week. Chapter six explained the closing process and post-closing trial balance. In chapter seven, we'll explain the accounting process for retail and wholesale sales. In this first of the two sections, we are introduced to reporting transactions for a retailer in general journal. There are three types of business operations. We have service, merchandising, and manufacturing. A service business provides a service to its customers. A merchandising business sells a product to its customers and generates a profit to those sales. And a manufacturing business makes a product and sells its products to customers or retailers who then sell it to customers. And in this chapter, we will be working with merchandising. A retailer is another name for a merchandising business. It sells directly to customers. And a merchandising business will sell goods that, that it purchases from its suppliers and will keep track of its available for sale stock in an account called merchandise inventory. Merchandise inventory is the stock of goods a merchandising business keeps on hand. A merchandising inventory is an asset account which will appear on the balance sheet. So it will be our new bank, uh, account that we will be using for this chapter. The new accounts we will be using in this chapter are summarized in this slide. We have sales, sales tax payable, sales discounts, sales returns and allowances, and credit card expenses. It tells you the type of the account so you know how to treat it using the cheat sheet that I provided to you in, uh, for chapter 2. Sales is a type of revenue account. Sales tax payable is a liability account. Sales discount is a contra revenue. Sales return and allowances is a contra revenue. And a credit card expense is, a, is an expense. So you will know how to treat it as a credit or debit depending if you're going to increase or decrease the account. This uh, table gives you the normal balance so you'll know where um, the normal balance will end up and that's when you add both totals on each the debit and the credit to determine if you are going to record the balance on your balance sheet as either a credit or, or debit. And then it gives you an explanation on how to use the, the, the record. So for example for sales is for sales of mer merchandise inventory Tax, sales tax payable is for sales tax charged to customers. Sales discounts is early payment discounts given to a buyer or seller. And sales returns and allowances are products returned by buyer on the seller's books. And the credit card expenses are fees charged by credit card companies to sellers. In this presentation, the examples will be for a business known as Max Out. Um, I think it's called Max Out Sporting Goods. And the sales account is the primary revenue account for a merchandising company. So let's suppose a business sells merchandise for cash on account. So the journal entry to record a sale of $500 for cash on January 2nd is provided in this slide. You cover chapters 1 through 6 already, which was all that was covered in the midterm, which covers the entire accounting cycle. We will be using all of those concepts again, except we are going to be using them in very specific ways, in this case for merchandise accounting. So in order to record a sales of $500 for cash on January 2nd is by debiting a cash for $500 and crediting 
sales for 500 and it is to record cash sales. Nothing new that you have uh, not learned throughout these six chapters. Max out sporting goods also grants credit terms to certain customers. One of those customers in this case is Roy Anderson. And on January 3rd, Max Out Sporting Goods sold merchandise on credit to Roy Anderson, issuing a sales slip of uh, number 1101 for $400. And so the journal entry to record the sales is presented in this slide, and we do that by, remember when it's on account, we have accounts receivable involved as a debit for $400 and we credit the sales account for $400 and it's sold merchandise on credit to, an, to this specific person, Roy Anderson, and the sales slip is 1101. Remember that the description down here should be an enough description that will actually remind you as to what the transaction was for. So if it's too vague and you're asking yourself, okay, what is this for? Then you're not putting enough information on that description. The description should be as long, it should be long enough to inform you why the transaction was made. Okay, and remember that accounts receivable, it's because they have not given cash to us yet. So we have to record an accounts receivable knowing that that money is owed to us in the future in cash. And so the journal entry presented here records Roy Anderson's payment on the amount due on January 31st. So we sold him on the previous slide um, $400 worth of merchandise on credit, and that was January 3rd. So on January 31st, we received payment. So we have to record that transaction by debiting our cash account for $400 because now we're increasing our cash account because we're receiving cash from Roy and we are decreasing or crediting our accounts receivable since he has paid the amount that was owed. And that is a description as received cash from Roy Anderson on account. And uh, one thing that could have been done in this example, like the previous one, they added the sales slip 1101 that's something that could have been added here too so we know that this transaction was actually attached to a specific uh, sales slip most uh, state and local governments impose a sales tax on a sales tax on the sale of certain goods and services and businesses are required to collect this tax from their customers and pay to the tax agency. This means that the business is actually acting as a place that holds this money. It does not go to the business as profit. You, they just collect it, hold it, and send it to the tax agency when it's required. So when taxable goods and services are sold on credit, the sales tax is usually recorded at the time of sale, even though it will be collected from the customer at a later time. A liability account called sales tax payable is credited for the sales tax charged. And the reason we're bringing in this new account is because it's important that we separate what money we're collecting that is not going to stay in the business versus collecting money that it's going somewhere else. And that type of uh, sales should be for the sales tax. So if Max, max Out Sporting Goods was required to charge its customers an 8% sales tax, which is the 8% sales tax here in California, at least in Orange County. I know that there it varies. The amount collected for the sales tax on a $500 sales for cash would be 
$40. And the way that you actually um, determine that amount is by multiplying $500 times 8%. You'll do that in a simple calculator and it'll give you a total of $40. The amount collected from the customers would be $540 in this case, which is $500 for the merchandise plus $40 for the sales tax. So the journal entry to record a sale of $500 plus tax for cash is presented in this slide. And we do that by debiting our cash for $540. And we, and we credit two separate accounts. One of them is going to be for the sales tax payable for $40. And the other one's going to be for sales or revenues for $500. And this is to record cash sales. So see how we have two separate accounts now where we are collecting our sales tax that we're collecting from customers. And we're going to hold that money in this account until we are required to send it to the sales tax agency as a payment. If Max Out Sporting Goods sold merchandise on credit, um, in this case is for January 8th, for $800, I mean $600 plus tax, it would bill the customer $600 plus $48 for the tax. Remember, the way to determine the tax amount is multiplying $600 times 8% tax. If your problems on the homework give you a different sales tax, then you multiply by that sales tax that they're asking you to calculate, okay? In this case, whenever, if it's not mentioned, it's going to be 8%. So it's $600 times 8% equals $48 worth of tax. So the total amount billed would be $648. It will be $600 for the merchandise plus $48 for the sales tax. So the journal entry to record the sales is presented in this slide as accounts receivable as a debit for $648. Accounts receivable is because it was sold on credit, remember. And then we credit sales tax payable because we have not received that yet for $48 and sales for $600. And this is to record sold merchandise on credit to this person and and sales slip 1102. The sales slip, which we have been talking about uh, in these few slides, tells us who the customer is and the sales amount, the sales tax charged, and, um, and the total amount that the customer must pay. And this is just an example. Your business may have your own sales slip. So it's just a matter of having the information that you are needed or required to collect in order to appropriately make your accounting records for your business. If something is wrong with the goods sold, which will happen in your business at some point or another, the firm may take back the goods or the business may take back the goods resulting in a sales return or they may negotiate a reduction in the sales price resulting in a sales allowance okay so sales return obviously is as it states you re the customer returns the product for a full refund or you as a business owner may negotiate with your customer to give give them a sales allowance so they won't return it but you will give them a better price for the product if the goods returned were initially paid for with cash the customer will receive a cash refund but when it, a return or allowance is related to a credit sale 
the normal practice is to issue do a document called a credit memorandum to the customer instead of giving a cash refund. Okay. Now, when a customer returns a product, the business makes an opposite entry of that of a sale. So instead of debiting the sales account, we debit the sales return and allowances account. And by debiting sales returns and allowances, instead of debiting the sales account, management can monitor the balance of the sales returns and allowances and see if the product returns or allowances are increased, okay? So the sales return and allowances account is a contra revenue account. This is a new term, contra revenue account that keeps track of all customer returns. So a contra revenue account is an account with a debit balance which is contrary to the normal balance of a revenue account. Okay, so the journal entry to record a cash refund for a return on January 2nd for $100 in merchandise sold for cash plus a sales tax of $8 is presented in this slide we debit the sales returns and allowances for $100. We also debit the taxable, the tax payable for $8. And that's because it's 8%, so $100 times 8% is $8. And then we credit our cash account for $108 total. And this is a, a reason for this is for a refund to customer for returned merchandise and sales tax paid. Okay, now here is an example of a sales allowance in which, which is granted to a customer named Ann Ann. So let's revisit the sale on account to Ann Ann of $600 plus sales tax of $48 recorded on January 8th. So if Max Out Sporting Goods issued a credit memorandum, in this case is credit memorandum number 101 on January 20th, for a return of $200 merchandise purchased on account by Ann Ann, plus $8, $8 um, plus 8% sales tax, the credit memorandum would total $216. It's $200 for the merchandise returned plus $16 sales tax at 8%, which was previously billed to Ann Ann. Okay, now the sales... Um, the sales returns and allowances account will be debited for $200 and the sales tax payable account will be debited, debited by $1,600, I mean $16 and the corresponding credit of $260 will go to the customer's account receivable account. And so this is the way that it looks for your T accounts. Remember, you taught, you learned about T accounts in the previous chapters. So a sales allowance will reduce net sales on the income statement and will reduce accounts receivable and sales tax payable on the balance sheet. Okay. The use of credit is considered to be one of the most important factors in the in the rapid growth of a business in, in today's terms. So stores grant credit to make it easier for customers to purchase goods. Like anything else, there's an advantage and there's also disadvantages. Okay. 
and they're they're listed here. So the advantage for credit sales is the volume of both sales and profits will increase if buyers are given a period a period of a month or more to pay for the goods or services they purchase. Disadvantages of credit sales is cr sales on credit will lead to increases in profit only if each customer completes the transaction by paying for the goods or services purchased. If the payment is not received, the expected profits become actual losses and the purpose for granting the credit is defeated. So therefore, businesses need to closely analyze a customer's ability to pay before granting credit, which now explains to you why everyone wants to look at your credit score. So decisions about granting credit may be based on personal judgment or on reports available from credit bureaus, information supplied by other creditors, and credit ratings supplied by national firms such as Dunn and Bradstreet. The four most common types of credit sales are open account credit, business credit cards, bank credit cards, and cards issued by credit card companies. And you should become familiar with what each one is and how to account for each type of transaction, especially if something if you are considering for your business. Sales to customers are using bank credit cards and cards issued by credit card companies require special accounting procedures, okay? Sales made to customers paying with bank credit cards such as MasterCard and Visa are treated as cash sales. In most cases, the amount processed on the card is transferred to the seller's bank account the same day and fees charged by the credit card company for processing these sales are debited to an account called credit card expenses. This is an example of sales to customers using bank credit cards. We have maxed out sporting goods selling merchandise on January 15th, totally $900 to customers using bank credit cards plus an 8% sales tax and the bank credit card company charges a 3% discount fee. So what this is showing you is that the merchandise sale was a total of $900. You collected an 8% tax, which equals $72. So your total collection from the customer is $972. However, you're paying 3% to the credit card, to the bank company for the transaction, which is actually amounts to $29.16, so your actual debit to cash is $942.84, which now explains to you as a business owner why you should, why when sometimes you go as a consumer to a business, they require you to use a credit card with a minimum amount charged, or they charge you a fee for using the credit card. And that is because the business is, it's costing them money to provide you with that service. Now this is how a journal entry to record the sales made to customers using bank credit cards should look like. And this is for a transaction made on January 15th. Okay, we have a debit for cash for $942.84. This is based on the example back here, okay? We have a debit for cash for $942.84. We have a debit for credit card expense for $29.16. We have the sales as a credit for $900 and a sales tax payable for $72, which is amounts to 8%. And this is to record the sales to customers using bank credit cards. Now you're seeing how this is becoming a little more in detail in terms of the general journal transaction recording process versus before you would just record a sales into your revenues and whether you received it on cash or credit, then you would record it in your cash account or your accounts uh, receivable. But uh, now it's actually getting a little more uh, detail oriented. We're recording that it's going in as a 
cash as a credit card expense? Are we collecting tax? Uh, what was the sales about? And so forth. Now, um, if a customer pays with a non-bank credit card, such as an American Express, the sales is accounted for as a sales on account. And the amount remitted to the seller should equal the net of the discount fee. Okay, now you understand why some people don't use, uh, you, they don't have the American Express available as a form of payment. Costco just went out of that business, went into of uh, these I believe this is an example of sales to customers using a non bank credit card so we have max out sporting goods sales merchandise on January 16 totaling $1,000 to customers paying with an American Express plus 8% sales tax the American Express charges a 7% discount fee and the discount withheld by American Express would be $75.16, and that is uh, determined by multiplying your total transaction. Notice it is $1,000, but it's an 8% sales tax, which amounts to $1,080. And then you determine your discount by multiplying $1,080 times 7%, which is $75.16. And 60 cents. So, how are we going to record that? This is how a journal entry to record the sales of a payment by American Express should look like. It's a journal entry made on January 23rd, and that is by debiting accounts receivable for 1080. This 1080 is the total amount sold plus 8% tax, and then you separate what that means. Well, it was a sales for $1,000, and there was a tax payable for $80. And that is to record sales to customers using an American Express. But then you need a second entry, which is for the credit card expense. The credit card expense, remember, was a $43.20 charge, which is a debit. Then you debit $1,036 with $80. And you credit accounts receivable for $1,080. And this is to record payment received from American Express. If you don't remember why we came up with this numbers, it's actually in the previous slides right here. Okay? This is how we came up with these amounts down here. And that is it for section one. So now we will learn how to record transactions for a wholesaler. Okay? The other one, the first section was for merchandising businesses. Now we're going to do it for a wholesaler. How do wholesale businesses record credit sales? So a wholesale business is a firm which sells goods to another firm who then sells it to the final customer. Okay. Every business that you go to as a retailer gets their merchandise from somewhere else. Most likely is from the wholesale business firms. When a business sells goods to other businesses, they frequently offer trade and or cash discounts, which vary according to the nature of the business. Trade discounts are for... Um, are not the same as cash discounts. A trade discount is a reduction from the list price. The list price is established is the established retail when businesses sell goods to other businesses. Okay? So the net price is the list less minus all trade discounts, okay? Now we have Modern Sportsman, a wholesaler, offers credit terms of one-tenth on net 30 to its customer. On January 20th, Modern Sportsman sh sold merchandise for $2,000 on account to max out sporting goods. 
issuing invoice 909. So now we know that Max House Sporting Goods is actually getting their products from Modern Sportsman, which is a wholesale. Modern Sportsman received payment for invoice 909. Mine is the cash discount of $20, which is a 1% from the $2,000 that were sold on January 29th. And this is how it's recorded. We debit accounts receivable for $2,000 and we credit the sales for $2,000, which is for the sell merchandise on credit to max out sporting goods, which was an invoice for 909, invoice 909, and the terms were here. Remember, this means that they get a 1% discount if they pay it early, otherwise it's due in 30 days. If you don't remember how to read that, look at my previous lectures. That's the first transaction. The second one is for the sales discount, so we have to record the 1% discount. And that's a $20 on this $2,000 merchandise sold. So the company actually sold the product to um, Max Out Sporting Goods for $1,980. And then we credit our accounts receivable for $2,000. And this is because they receive payments on account from Max Out Sporting Goods, which was for invo invoice 909. See how there's the invoice is the key here to make sure you keep all your records straight. Now, more modern sportsmen sells merchandise for $1,000 on account to max out sporting goods on January 21st. The terms is a 1% discount, otherwise it's um, owed in 30 days, and that is invoice 910. And max out sporting goods returned $100 of the merchandise on January 23rd, receiving a credit memorandum uh, 120 from Modern Sportsman and Max Out Sporting Goods paid the balance owed minus a 1% discount on January 30th. So the amount received by M Modern Sportsman on January 30th would be $891, which is presented here. Okay, so now we're dealing with the you as a business returning stuff to your wholesaler for whatever reason. Okay. And what it says here is, is a customer returning merchandise and paying within the discount period is only entitled to the, a cash discount on the balance owed after the return. So the original sale was for $1,000 minus the return of $100. So our balance is $900. But you have to subtract the 1% discount because that's what they gave us before. So that amounts to $9. So the actual amount received is $891. At the end of each accounting period, the balance of the sales return and allowances account and the sales discount account is subtracted from the balance of the sales account in the revenue section of the income statement. So the resulting figure is the net sales for the month ended January 31st, 2016. Okay, for example, The sales return and allowances account contains a balance of $600 at the end of January, and the sales discount account's balance is $100 at the end of January. So the sales account has, an, has a balance of $25,700 at the end of January, and the revenue section for the firm's income statement is presented here. And notice how the $25,000 of sales is derived. Okay? Pretty self-explanatory. Now, accounts receivable is a big asset on the balance sheet for most businesses, and this asset must be converted into cash in a timely manner. If not, there's a cash flow problem that will service so an accounts receivable ledger is a subsidiary ledger that contains credit
credit customer accounts. And this ledger makes it possible to verify that customers are paying their balances on time and that they are within their credit limits. And it also provides a convenient way to answer questions from customers regarding their balances or about a possible billing error, which almost always will occur. So a subsidiary ledger has three money columns because a business doesn't want to wait until the end of the month to find out which customers still owe them money. Anytime a customer's account is affected, the subsidiary ledger must be updated that same day, okay? The same day. And each sales return or allowance must be posted from the journal to the appropriate customer's account in the account's receivable ledger. In addition, any subsidiary ledger account must be updated daily. So please note the double posting preference or reference if the return has been journalized in the general journal instead, okay? This is posting from the general journal and the way that it will affect it. Now, at the end of each month, after all the postings have been made, the balances in the accounts receivable ledger must be proved against the balance of the accounts receivable general ledger account. So first, a schedule of accounts receivable which lists the subsidiary ledger account balances, it has to be prepared. And the total of the schedule is compared with the balances of the accounts receivable account. And if the two figures are not equal, then guess what? You know that there's an error and it must be located and corrected. Okay? Nothing new here. Now, the schedule of accounts receivable is simply a list of all of your customers and how much they owe. Okay? So at the end of each month, after all the postings have been made, the balances in the accounts receivable ledger must be proved against the balance of the accounts receivable general ledger account, and they must equal. So the total of individual customer balances must equal the accounts receivable balance. Okay. The schedule of accounts receivable is particularly important to a business owner or credit manager to keep track of how much money someone owes the company and for how long the that amount has been outstanding. Okay, so that's how you can compare your slips. And the figure here illustrates the relationship between the accounts receivable balance the accounts receivable ledger and the schedule of accounts receivable. Okay, so the accounts receivable ledger, you transfer the individual balances to the schedule of accounts receivable and that total should equal the accounts receivable balance in the general ledger. Okay. Now, the, record, the recording of the payment of sales taxes. A sales tax may be levied on all retail sales, but often certain items are exempt. So the retailer is required to collect sales taxes from customers, and the retailer make per, makes periodic reports to the taxing authority, and when it's due, they pay the taxes due when the reports are filed. So sales taxes collected must be submitted to the state on a regular basis. And the sales tax returns are, are filed monthly or quarterly depending on the state. So Max Out Sporting Goods submits its sales tax collected at the end of the month. And when it will it will complete a sales tax return in order to do that. So, 
The taxable gross sales for the month were $25,000 according to this document. This includes sales minus any returns and allowances, okay? Minus any returns and allowances. Otherwise, you're going to be paying more than you have to. So based on the sales tax return, Max Out Sporting Goods owes $2,000 of sales tax to the state, okay? This particular state allows an offset or discount in the amount of $20, okay? So the next taxes owed are $1,980. Um, and that's all I have for this chapter. Uh, it seems a little overwhelming of all the things that I discovered, but you have the basis of what the accounting um, process is. You just covered the entire accounting process. All I'm doing now is showing you those same concepts but digging a little deeper. In this case, it was a lot about taxes and merchandising. So then we will cover uh, when things are sold or when you um, um, work in the other way around when you are actually the, the versus the merchandising company to a retail, okay? So... From now on, the chapters are just going to dig a little deeper in terms of the accounting concepts that you have learned. We will be learning about taxes like this one, and then we will learn about payroll as well, which is a big part of your business if you have employees working under your business. So if you have questions, please let me know. You know how to reach me. Please complete the assignments that are due this week. And thank you for your time. Good luck to you.